Hello everybody and welcome to another video. Today uh, marked the live stream Points of Interest Arena Netran where they did in fact show off a bunch of Heart of Thorns exclusive stuff. They were clearly playing on some kind of warrior specialization or they were showing some kind of upgrade to the warrior that will be coming in the expansion but didn't talk about it at all. But we did get to see one of the new zones. We didn't quite get to see where it takes place on the world map. We got to see some of the new events. We got to see an example of an adventure. I'm going to give you guys the footage directly pulled from that live stream. I was recording on my own end as it went up. And uh, we'll talk about exactly what they showed us here. Um, so first of all, one minor thing, I'm going to give you guys a lot of quotes from the devs that I was furiously typing away as this live stream went on. Uh, one of them, uh, someone sent in some fan art straight away, this is only something minor, um, of a Massart. And Ruby quite openly speculated saying, oh I don't know if the Massart are the friendliest things on the planet. I have no idea if she really knows the story direction of the franchise, but I noticed that straight away. I was like, hmm, maybe the Massart. Uh, aren't going to be allies in the end or something? Or maybe she's just playing into the fact that, you know, they're a shade of grey and that's kind of cool. Uh, there are a few things um, that I want to show you guys straight away. Uh, once we jumped into the live stream, uh, we of course got to see the UI of the game. Now, I know from personal experience that ArenaNet have multiple different clients they run on the back end. They've got their regular live client, then they have other clients for, uh, you know, testing stuff out before it gets pushed live. And those other clients will probably be showing, like, future stuff. So, uh, one thing we do see straight away in the top right of the screen are listed all of the events and things going on in the area. Um, we have personal story was written. Um, now, the personal story, instead of actually saying some kind, of, some kind of name of a story step, for example, like, oh, go save Traherne or go battle Traherne or something, it instead just said, hey, this is basically the Heart of Thorns demo. And so this makes me think immediately this is some kind of demo build that many people will be playing in just a short matter of weeks when uh, Guild Wars 2 Heart of Thorns ends up at places like PAX East uh, and Res in Europe and so forth. Uh, as we wait for the expansion to release. So um, I believe that's what they're at. We're actually looking at. We're looking at a demo client. We we're playing on a dev account. At one point they disconnected. And when they reconnected you saw a lot of the dev commands come up and stuff. Pretty sure another dev did come in at one point on the live stream. Maybe I'll have some footage of this right now. It might be kind of hard to pick out. But uh, he was actually hostile to uh, Ruby and co that were actually playing. I don't believe that's necessarily a mechanic of Heart of Thorns, despite the amount I talked about, you know, the idea that they could be factions and stuff. I think really they just sort of triggered themselves as hostile for a bit of a joke. So we saw the personal story thing. We saw the meta event for the area they were stood in. And this meta event was called Outpost Pale Reaver Rally. So we can pretty much assume every single outpost that's going to be here, or most outposts, I'd guess, uh, like have a big meta event of their own. And then there will be like an even bigger, like map wide meta event. You will have noticed with Dry Top, with the Silver Wastes. We have these maps that only have one meta across the entire map. Now that same, they reinforced this idea, they gave, they talked about it on the stream. The idea is all these new Heart of Thorns maps will have that large map-wide thing. We've been given an example of this map they were showing on the live stream. How it has the day-night cycle thing and it's okay during the day and then it gets all terrible and hordes of Mordrum come out during the night. So that's like your big map-wide meta kind of thing. But there's still going to be small metas like seated within it too. And these are the outposts. So that's what that looked like. Then um, very interestingly, and I'll only talk about this briefly. But there was another meta event up there saying celebrate the new year of the RAM. Um, and so this looks like some kind of event that will be coming up with Guild Wars 2. As I say, from my personal experience, whenever I log into one of their alt clients, it tends to be like in the middle of the next few updates. But that seems interesting. I don't actually think that's going to be a part of Heart of Thorns necessarily. That could just be something we're seeing much more in the short term as a community. And uh, we'll just have to keep our eye on that for now. Okay, so what were we seeing here? We were seeing an area called Dry Step Mesas, and this was just a region of the larger map, which they didn't necessarily reveal to us, but thanks to the DC later on, uh, we got to see the loading screen. So the first map you'll be able to travel to in Guild Wars 2 Heart of Thorns with this day-night cycle is called Verdant Brink. So we were in Verdant Brink, the map, at the Dry Step Mesas uh, region. Um, this looked by the minimap. They did go onto the world map for a little bit of time during the live stream, uh, but we really couldn't get any context as to where it was in terms of like regular Tyria. Are we expecting some kind of world map extension? Maybe I would guess not, right? They're just going to fill in areas, but it was kind of one of these orangey zones. So you can look at Guild Wars 2's world map and maybe guess at where this perhaps could be. Uh, from the name, the Dry Step Mesas 
doesn't really even seem to suggest too much towards some of the old places we could go to, especially not since Dry Top is already in the game, even though Dry Top geographically doesn't really link up with Dry Top from Guild Wars 1, but, uh, but whatever. So we were in kind of one of these orangey areas with these big craggy zones. Uh, we could see around us lots of Mordrum vines reclaiming the area, presumably. Huge, huge vines. We got to see a couple of new enemies, um, which I'll get to in just a second. They came a little bit later. Um, and uh, it was during the day, so... They did specifically say what we saw on this live stream was the daytime stuff, and it looked pretty hellish and pretty hectic, right? It looked pretty terrible. There was burning debris and rubble flying out of the sky and crashing to the floor in the most absurd of ways. But this was while they were at peace. This is while the map was in a nice state. And so that is incredibly curious to me uh, what exactly will end up looking like when we get to the nighttime shots. Um, so we specifically within the dry step mesas were stood at the start next to a big felled packed ship There were loads of packed ships and ruins all over the place and where this ship had fallen was a place called lethal Vantage now they were stood next to what appeared to be some kind of a guild banner And they described eventually that this guild banner was how you would start an adventure So the adventures were this new feature they were talking about repeatable almost like quests that would track you individually uh, they did in fact confirm that adventures are going to be like a phased feature and by that I mean uh, let's say you are doing a heart event right and your goal for the heart is to tear down loads of propaganda posters from the separatists and Evanhawk okay that's phased for you when you tear down that poster your friend can go up to that same poster and press F as well it only changes on your client and they did confirm that with adventures the same thing would happen so you can be participating in the lethal vantage advent adventure that they showed us which I'll describe in a second and your friend can at the same time too and you don't sort of interrupt each other's progress and um, the adventure worked like this it was a uh, crash ship it had been overtaken by loads of vines thorns everywhere uh, and it was a very very simple premise it was you were on the clock you had a certain amount of time you were given a flamethrower so it wasn't like you'd go in there with your own build for this specific one you were given a flamethrower uh, with two skills and you had to get into this ship and you had to burn all of the vines away as quickly as you possibly could um, within the time limit and uh, ultimately they disconnected in the middle of showing this to us so it didn't quite work but uh, but yeah that's the way that adventure worked they did, did give us a lot more information about adventures too I uh, openly speculated in a recent video this week about how outposts seem to be like the next generation of hearts you know there were areas you could flock to and you'd find a lot of content around them well they specifically said here adventures are kind of like the next generation of hearts. The way they work is they literally become icons on your world map just like you would have points of interest, vistas and skill points. So as you explore all these new maps and even existing maps I suppose too if adventures will be existing there in regular Tyria, uh, you actually find these as just markers that you can go to now and you press F on them and you try and, and you activate them and then you try and complete whatever challenge that's supposed to be. And so they actually said yeah this is kind of like the development of hearts and they kind of I guess would compare outposts perhaps a little bit differently to other things. So that's what we were seeing. These are going to be a part of map completion it would seem. Uh, but certainly we've already heard that many of these give us uh, mastery points and things. My perspective of it from this live stream actually made it seem like adventures would be far more numerous than I was at first going to believe. Like I thought that they, there would only be a few, you know, maybe there'd be as many adventures as there currently are jumping puzzles or something, right? But no, it seems like there's going to be more, more numerous, especially if they're comparing them uh, specifically to hearts. They did, quite excitingly, pretty much confirm that the shooting gallery back in Divinity's Reach probably will be an adventure. They gave more examples. They said that they're going to be things like races, jumping puzzles. Uh, they said that for adventures, they didn't necessarily want them to all be on, like, just a timer. But there's always going to be that pressure there. You're always going to be tense. It's already always going to be difficult. They're supposed to be challenges, okay? Um, they were confirmed once again that they were going to be repeatable. They're based on your performance. And uh, this was said very offhandedly. And given what happened with Fractals of the Mist, I will set back just a little bit. But they did say uh, that there could be leaderboards for adventures. And um, Guild Wars 1 actually had a really cool feature. They were challenge missions, where each individual challenge mission did have a leaderboard for it. Leaderboards that were in-game, you could go up to an NPC and they would show you. And they would have, hey, who did this challenge the fastest or the best today? And whoever did it the best that day would actually get an in-game gold reward for it. And you could go to another tab and it would even be tracking uh, monthly. And it would even track quarterly who had done the best. Um... And so I love this idea. Guild Wars 2 is always, I, still doesn't really show leaderboards properly in game over on the PvP side. If we ended up with this kind of situation though, where you really could go to NPCs spread around the world, 
um, who would show you who, you know, what guilds, well, not necessarily guilds because they're individual tasks, right? But what show you what players maybe on your server bring a bit more importance back to the server that you chose perhaps in PvE and or, or even game-wide showed who had done really well here and maybe even give you little incentives to try and beat them for that daily record or whatever. That's such a cool idea to me. They did mention leaderboards and so that's very exciting. Whether they go the whole hog and do it as well as they did seven years ago, eight years ago in Guild Wars 1, who knows? Well, nine years ago, Jesus. Um, I guess eight when factions came out. So that's cool stuff about adventures. We saw the Lethal Vantage adventure. That should have been the footage that we were seeing there in the background. They, uh, there were other minor things. Like, you can actually see there's some different UI stuff. You see those green arrows um, plastered on one of the uh, on the airship itself that they're going to be going into. You'll notice when he claims the adventure, his dynamic event-like thing on his minimap changes. Uh, and generally, it just seems like a very cool idea, and I'm glad that we got to experience that. We'll also notice in this little bit of... Of the footage we do get for the briefest period of time a glimpse at the map during its like dark state hopefully I'll freeze frame this again was <laughs> we got so much out of this DC uh when uh, they log back in, you can see it's at night. Um, we can actually see a packed chopper. Uh, it almost looks like it's like some kind of new respawn animation, but that's totally not what's going on there. Uh, and they quickly toggle it back to day. I don't think we really get too much information beyond that, except the fact that there's events around. And as a bonus too, you can see one of these famed bouncing mushrooms we've heard so much about from Masteries right there available to interact with, but uh, we don't actually get to see how it works exactly because they just walk on by. So uh, let's go back a little bit, I guess, to earlier in the live stream. I was describing where we were in the world. We were at the Lethal Vantage Adventure in the region Dry Step Mesas. And it was confirmed this is like the first map you will go to explore when you get into Heart of Thorns. And they say specifically this is the area amongst all these packed ruins where Loranthia of the Wild crashed. And um, it's basically right near this outpost where you can begin to help Loranthia and his Pale Reavers, his stragglers... Um, strike out, they said specifically, and take the fight back to Morgamoth. And so, um, essentially, they went up a big hill to an area that could be contested by enemies, and there were a bunch of Pale Reavers sniping at Morgum off in the distance. The character could even claim a sniper rifle of their own and start sniping too, a lot like we see in Diesa Plateau, which for the record is really fun. Uh, Loranthia said something cool when they went up, and they were like, oh look, he's recognised that the commander of the pact is here, everyone's happy now. And so, uh, Morgum began to attack this location, and it looked like kind of a base Basic defend event. Uh, a few enemies came up into the circle. One of them, interestingly enough, was called a Mordrum Court Punisher, a big guy with a hammer. Uh, and interestingly, of course, we have the Nightmare Court. What is the Mordrum Court? Is this what the Nightmare Court begun become when they decide, yeah, we do want to be a part of Mordrumoth? I don't know. But um, what we were looking at, really, guys, is the way outposts kind of work. And they talked a lot about outposts and their philosophies for outposts. So here's a few uh, choice quotes to maybe help us solidify a little bit more what they are. Uh, at one point it was said that if you claim an outpost, so outposts are like areas I guess initially that even have to be claimed from the enemies and then they're slowly built up. Imagine like you could claim an area that's completely destroyed, a bunch of Hylic move in, this is what I have in my head now, and through tons of events over a long period of time you actually build this outpost up, you build, you can, you help them construct huts and stuff and you actually build a real fortification. They say um, that one of the core things they want about outposts is they want people to be able to play around an outpost and really see their impact on the world. Uh, what impact specifically they said did I have on the area here? And that's the idea behind Outpost. Dynamic Events already had some of that in launch and that was a huge idea behind the Dynamic Events, but sometimes it could get lost, right? Because you'd complete one event and then how are you supposed to know that 120 seconds later another event's going to trigger? You've already wandered off, you've got your reward and it's over. So that's the idea of Outpost. They say if you claim an Outpost, you could be there for well over an hour. Um, they say that all outposts as well. Um, our example of outposts before were these forts in the Silver Wastes. And it was said that these were kind of like a precursor to the idea. Now the thing about the Silver Wastes though is those forts are pretty much only there to contribute to like the big map wide objective. Okay, like the, the big thing where we eventually take out the Vinewrath. Now today on the live stream they said all outposts will contribute to the map wide objective. Which for this map is the day night cycle thing. Um, but they also say that outposts are more specific specifically trying to tell their own stories too. So when you're at an outpost, it's not all about the big map-wide objective. It will influence that. 
but um, you know, a lot of them are much more centralized in telling their own stories, and uh, they're trying to be a bit more local in that way, and that's something I really like. It basically sounds like they've just taken meta events and tried to do them really, really, really well. Uh, Ruby said at one point, uh, so basically the idea is, is not just cap something and run away, you want to cap there and stay. Again, this quote, you could be there at an outpost for well over an hour, they say. So this is how long you'd want to hang out with these people and how invested you get with pe these people. And I argue that that's actually a really good idea because the longer you spend around certain NPCs and get to know certain NPCs, the more that desire to actually stay and help defend them um, actually sticks about, you know, instead of just seeing a random town on fire and coasting past it like we sort of currently do in the game. Um, so on that same topic too, they talked about the way kind of story and characters are being handled in terms of events in general in Heart of Thorns, but also Outposts in particular. And they talked about how in Guild Wars 2, um, you have tons of events, like, all over the place, right? And pretty much all of the events, even in the case of a lot of metas, all these events are dealing with different characters. You know, you go to Haratha, your hinterlands, you meet some random dudes that want to take out a place in, in, you know, one of these centaur camps. You help them cap it, they say, top trumps, cheers mate, and then you walk off, right? And you don't really see those characters anymore. And because there are so many of those characters, you kind of never care about those characters, but they just kind of settle into these archetypes, you know? Oh, this is the damsel in distress. Oh, this is the, you know, the wounded seraph guard trying to get his doliac from A to B. Oh, this is the exact same equivalent, except this time it's a Norn somewhere out in the, in the Shiver Peaks, okay? So uh, they talked about this and how they didn't really like that very much. If we as players want to care a lot about these outposts and these characters around them, um, we should get to know those characters more. So here's a quote. They said they wanted to, with outposts, to keep characters cast. They want to uh, focus on stories with a smaller cast of characters and sort of provide people with very long event chains, like really long event chains and webs where you are continuously with this same character. And through various events, you learn a lot more about them and their personalities. That was a very exciting idea to me because it means that a player who just does one event, say with Lorantha of the Wild, might see, you know, very a very aggressive side of Lorantha's personality. While if you stick around long enough, you may eventually see him, you know, ease up a little bit and you may see other parts about him. You'll learn other things about his history and stuff and so because they're reusing characters a lot this makes you feel a lot more connected to them and that to me is very very important in a lot of ways dynamic events in terms of story have been terrible terrible things for this game like they don't tell story well at all and this is one of the biggest reasons why i always wanted kind of a traditional questing style approach to come back so this could mean big things for the law for our connection to the universe and i like it a lot even um they tossed out the idea that uh, characters are going to be like so permanent and so um you know uh, around so present in the expansion you may even see uh, a character in one map and then set that same character might be in a, in, a, in a later map in a totally different event chain and that that is uh, that's very very cool um, so again, that's the idea of Outposts. We saw a little bit of it. Unfortunately, because I think Outposts are such a long-term thing and they are so um, best shown if many of the events are being demonstrated and we only got to see one. I, I think we only got a slim taste. But a lot of the quotes we had while they were out there participating in this one with the Loranthe, um was actually really, really, really cool to see. Uh, and I guess also one thing I, I didn't really mention that I do have in my notes here is we did see a new enemy. You guys should have been seeing footage of this uh, called the Mordrum Breacher. Um, and the idea of this thing is, uh, it's like a big vine, and it tunnels up from underground. It's kind of like, um, it reminds me of Command and Conquer, and why you'd always want to put concrete in your base. These guys are going to tunnel up, and apparently then just continuously start spawning enemies. The things look massive. The map itself does look beautiful, but I feel like there's not too much value to me saying that. I think they've been phenomenal with their environments for a very long time. And, uh, and I guess that, that's pretty much it, guys. That's what we got out of the live stream. They did say that there will be a bonus points of interest. We're full into, like, the information release uh, cycle right now. There's going to be a bonus points of interest where they talk about masteries coming up next Wednesday. So usually this live stream is bi-weekly. Uh, this time it's going to be weekly, or at least for now. And, uh, and yeah, mastery information will be coming there. What was going on with this warrior where he had two burst skills? I have no idea. He had an F1 and an F2. The F2 was like clearly a locked skill back there though. So was he specialized or is this just like a cool thing that warriors are going to be getting? I'm maybe a little bit underwhelmed if that's all they get as like their specialization. But you know, we don't know how minor these things eventually are going to be. I like the idea though that they can spend their adrenaline and instead hit F2 and that will weapon swap them regardless of their weapon swap. 
crop cooldown and execute the burst skill straight away. That would allow for some like crazy cool combos where you can, you know, do a certain rotation, weapon swap, get out some massive hit and then weapon swap straight back again using F2 instead of F1. Uh, but they didn't talk about it at all, so we shall see. Again, actually, uh, I'm posting this in at the end of the video because I got curious and went back and looked. Again, thanks to the DC... We can indeed inspect their character select screen. Uh, this character still has the regular warrior icon on it. So maybe this isn't a specialization, guys. But interestingly enough, in that second character slot... Oh, look, what do we see there? This is some kind of new icon. Is this the druid specialization? Who knows? But uh, yeah, they have a level 1 character that is clearly already specialized. That is very interesting to me. Also means perhaps you can be specialized at just level 1. Uh, but yeah, there you go, guys. Another interesting tidbit. Let me know what you think about that in the comments if you like. Anyway, there you go, guys. That's basically the news that came out today. Uh, let me know if you're still enjoying this style of coverage. And I will absolutely endeavor to keep it up. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, your support as this has been going on has been really awesome. Uh, let's have uh, a lot more cool stuff to talk about going forward. So cheers, guys. Have a great evening. I'll see you tomorrow.